I'm Angel Donovan, and this is the Dating Skills Podcast. This is a 14-year ongoing mission to discover the truth about what works in dating, sex, and relationships, to become a better man. Join me as I leave no stone unturned, chase down every expert, role model, and mentor with insights to get us to that goal as fast as possible. This show is about bringing you the best of that information so that you can take it in and change your life for the better, step by step, episode by episode. Angel Donovan here with another episode of Dating Skills Podcast. We're at episode 51 and the topic today is emotional transference. What does that mean? You may have heard that emotions are contagious. Well, there's a lot of science behind this, and it's really true. It's not just some kind of cliche statement. So obviously, when you're meeting women, when you're dating women, this makes your emotions very important. You'll notice that if you are anxious, she becomes anxious. If you are negative, she becomes negative. If you're positive, she becomes positive, and so on. So emotions are really, really important. But that doesn't mean that this is easy. I would say that this is one of the harder and more advanced topics, but essential if you really want to get the most out of your dating life in the long run. And and particularly if you want to be actually satisfied with it, you know, you can get some good results, but sometimes you want to actually be satisfied with that. But working on your emotions will get you to the point where you can have healthier relationships with yourself and with women in general, as well as getting much better results as well due to this emotional transference. So we touched on this subject a little bit when we were talking with Robert Green a few episodes ago, and we we were talking about the rake, which is an archetype, which is a type of seductor, which uses his emotions uh, very strongly. He leans on them a lot. So the guy we have today is, in fact, the Asian rake. Uh, We spoke to him in a previous podcast, you remember, and he's one of my good buddies, so it's great to have him back on the podcast. He launched last year a new system, which is actually his system. It's it's a system that he developed since over over time and which he's kind of stuck with and evolved with ever since he got into all of this, and it's very emotions-based. And he's called the Asian rake for a reason, because this was his style. He has a very emotional style. And that system I I looked at and uh, I gave a really solid review because I felt it was very mature. I felt that, you know, a lot of advanced guys in particular can get a a lot out of this. I mean, when I was going through it myself, I was like, yeah, this is something I need to work on a bit more too. So, you know, it's very, very healthy also for the long run. And I feel that it'll help guys uh, feel more satisfied with their dating life also, which is really should be your ultimate end goal. Not just getting results, but also feeling really, really awesomely happy about this area of your life. So David, if you remember, he's an academic, he's a PhD, and he's actually writing papers at the moment and collaborating with other researchers. So he's still in that area, you know, in the science world, he's still connected with that and he continues to invest in that although he left left his uh, university position. So as usual, you can get all the show notes, a transcript and everything like that at the address datingskillsreview.com slash DSP51. Now let's get into this interview. Okay, David, it's great to have you on the show. Did you know that the most popular podcast episode we've ever had was episode 19? And guess who was on that show? Really? Yeah, you were, man. So, awesome. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, I know. People love oh, that show. So cool. It's kind of funny because it's just about Asia and Asian women. Yeah. So it's kind of a niche subject, but it still turned out to be the top one. Oh, so that's far. great. It's cool to hear. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I love, well, I love talking to you. I love being on here. Yeah, me too. And great to have you back on the show. It's, it's, it's awesome to have you here. So I like I, we, last time we didn't really go a lot into your background. It's something I've started doing uh, with, with a lot of people here now. So could you could just give us a, a quick background of how you got into this whole dating relationship stuff? What happened? Yeah, uh, well, when I was 25, I got married. I was a conservative, <laughs> Christian, Chinese, Canadian boy who wanted to have guilt-free sex. <laughs> so okay. I... Married the, the sweet girl that I was dating at the time. And mm. then it, of course, did go well because I had no clue about relationships. I was insecure and, and so on. Yep. Um, and it fell apart after about four or five years we were separated. And we were in different parts of the world. And I needed to get my, my social life back together, mm. let alone my dating life. I didn't even have the social life. Um, and I was lucky enough to have met 
at the university campus, um, one of the uh, key guys in this pickup artist community at the time, which was mm. this is almost a decade ago, Christian Hudson, who now runs The Social Man. So he was my mm. first mentor and kind of just mm. got me started and entree into this whole world. And then I, I'm a very avid learner, so I just devoured all this information really quickly and went out and applied it as much as I could. And then I, I went to China and, and tried it there. And what was great about China was as I was getting better in, in Chinese, I, my, my game and results got better, but I was forced to focus on the nonverbals because my, mm. my Chinese fluency wasn't as good at the beginning. That really forced me to, to get back to the fundamentals and focus on body language, my, just the sound of my voice, to the strict tonality itself, fashion and eye contact. And that's really yeah. where the rake style became my main thing because it wasn't so much about eloquence or a lot of routines or complicated words. It was a lot more about just understanding, feeling your emotions and, and letting those take hold. Yeah, like I want to dig quite deeply into rake and in, in all the rake thing in a minute because yeah, you right. basically, st as you said, you started right from that at the beginning and I want to look into why that was uh, apart from you know what you just said. So quickly, let's cover a few other things. Uh, how old are you right now? Uh, I just turned 37 a few months ago. Uh -huh. Where do you live? I moved to Singapore to become a professor of mm. Asian philosophy and religion yep. at the National University of Singapore. Mm. And then a few years into that, I resigned to go full time into starting the Aura Dating Academy, mm. which is my, my company here, which trains people in dating and, and relationships. So that's very successful now. We've had hundreds of live clients and mm. thousands of, of people all over the world who've uh, benefited from the materials we've been putting out. Mm. So, yeah, it came down to a choice of um, do I want to make a difference in, in people's in, in a very important part of people's lives, which is relationships. Or do I want to keep teaching college kids something very erudite and abstract that they may never use right. in their lives? <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. yeah, I can totally understand how you switched there. How many women would you slay, say you slept with to date? Oh, over 200. But I, I haven't been counting for yeah. years. Right, right. That tends <laughs> to you? happen. Have you been, no, I stopped, I stopped counting somewhere around 80. Um, and then yeah. that was I, like a few years ago. I stopped counting around 150. That's quite um, But even then, I... I Oh, yeah, but around at past 50, it was got really fuzzy. Like, like, right, right, just right. Just kind of guesstimated. So <laughs> how many relationships have you had? Oh, wow. Well, significant ones is the, the ex-wife. And after that, mm. uh, I would say five relationships that really mattered in terms like then that, that each lasted more than a year. Right. I mean, you've had like you just came out of one that was quite long. Yeah. You've had really was, long uh, relationships. Four years. Yeah, it just came mm. out of one that was four years exclusive. Right, right. Um, and then and then your marriage mm -hmm. was how long? Seven years total. Mm. Okay, Seven cool. Years. Right. Yeah, I'm an old older guy. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And and so what is your dating and relationships lifestyle like today? You know? Is and are you happy with it or are you changing it? Yeah, now well, I got out of a longer relationship. I didn't mm. just get I think it's now been more than half a year. Right. From a four year relationship. And I'm not in any mood to settle down in terms of get, you know, forming deep attachments. One, one interesting thing that changed a lot is I used to do a lot of dates. Mm -hmm. Like I, and I would close on the first date. Usually, like I try to close on the first date, really gun for it. Mm -hmm. Now I'll put in maybe 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. And if it's not a, if it's not a done deal, I'll either friend zone her and I love, you know, just having female friends. It's great. Yeah. Or I'll just next her and mm -hmm. I don't have the patience to invest any more time. So, so you're doing coffee dates kind of thing? Nah, no, yeah, exactly. No coffee dates, no cocktail dates. Oh, I thought you are doing coffee dates. How'd you, how'd you make it a 15 minute date if you're not just like... Oh, no, I just, I just go clubbing and I just escalate hardcore. Mm. You know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, you know, usually half the time I go out, something mm. happens. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then there's just exploring just these, just more extreme, I think more extreme lifestyles. I think when you, when you've decided in your mind that you're after something short term and it's, and you get really good at, at the sex. I don't yeah. know if you, I remember some, I sent you some emails about like me exploring these different, this different knowledge, right? This like the squirting thing I asked you about. Yeah. So I've been like really training myself in the mm. sexual area. I got one-on-one -on -one coaching in tantric sex, which was just awesome. Three days of intensive one-on-one. -on -one. I think I'm putting out a vibe, you know, it's emotional transference again. And it's been attracting a certain type of 
girl, like a girl, the girls mm-hmm. that are looking for a good time. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't judge. I mm-hmm. just give them, you know, we're all going to have a good time. So I've, I've had quite a lot of group experiences in the past half year that have been fun. Just having a lot of fun. Just having a lot of fun. Great, man. It does sound like you're having a lot of fun. And you'll have to give me the reference uh, for that tantric sex uh, coach afterwards. Oh, yeah. Yeah, something yes. I want to get into too. Awesome. So yeah. let's talk about the Asian rake and where he came from. How did you decide that name? You just you just mentioned that kind of you had to focus on your fundamentals, which weren't language. Yet. So mm. is that where it really came from originally? Why did you decide to call yourself the Asian rake? And well, I'm a very. It turns out that I'm a very emotional guy. Mm. <laughs> so my horoscope, if you believe in things like that, is a dragon Scorpio, uh-huh. which is like the most explosive, baroque, dramatic figure. That could that when you combine the two horses, oh, really? you know, it's like crazy. I didn't know that. So I'm like, if you, you know, the crazy drama dude, mm. <laughs> and if I can channel that emotion into something productive, it's very constructive. Right. I found that I was just like this boiling cauldron of emotions, and when I read the rake description of the rake in Robert Greene's book Art of Seduction, yeah, it helped me see when I was effective and why I was effective when I was effective, mm-hmm. and that made me decide that I would specialize in this style and explore that even more. Mm. And I just amplified everything um, right. to see how far I could take it. Great. Great. So when we had Robert Green on a couple of months back, he gave us some specific examples. We were talking about like who could be rake role models in today's society? Who would we look mm-hmm. at? Like if we ch- kind of, if people wanted to kind of understand what a rake is like. Cool. And some of the guys we came up with were Mick Jagger, Tiger Woods, yeah. Russ- Russell Brand, 50 Cent, Ben Affleck, Bill Clinton... <laughs> Are there any guys you have in your mind who, who are you know, obviously in the public mind's eye, so everyone can kind of like see them, who yeah. you've inspired from or you think they represent true rakes? Yeah. Well, I don't know the, these people personally. Right, right. Tom Cruise in Top Gun. So I know the characters in the movies. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Right. So Tom Cruise in Top Gun, definitely. Mm. See, like to me, Bill, uh, Bill Clinton, I, don't, I haven't um, learned enough about his personal life. He might be like a rake. But mm. he seems to me more like a charismatic. And that was my sub character. When I was in situations where I wasn't just hitting on girls, like just trying to get sex fast. Mm. And I was just hanging around and there were girls in the social circle. Rake, the rake style is not great for that. Mm. You know, like when you're trying to preserve social value and, and over the long term, mm. um, like it, when you're doing social circle games. So char- the charismatic style was is a lot better suited to those situations. So. Mm-hmm. I looked at Bill Clinton actually as an example of a charismatic and kind of, kind of emulating his charm, mm-hmm. really laid back. Um, but yeah, the, the rake, there's a one guy, let me tell you about this one guy. Mm-hmm. He's Iranian, he's an Iranian citizen, speaks Russian fluently, has, has a medical degree. I think he practiced medicine for a little while mm-hmm. as a resident in, in Moscow. And I met him in Beijing through a mutual contact. And this guy was the quickest and most effective seducer I've met in my life still to this point, mm. like that I've seen. He didn't speak a single word of Chinese. He was there to learn Chinese, but he was a total beginner. And he never, I never heard him try <laughs> to speak Chinese. So when we were out, but we were, we were out, everything he did was just pure emotional transference. Like he had the sexy tonality. He had great body language um, and he had a decent body. He was a little bit taller than me, mm. good shape. Um, he wasn't like a model or anything. Mm-hmm. He would do the whole, I'm in love with you. <laughs> he'd stop the girl and his opener would be I'm in love with you Wow! and he'd do that thing where he'd stick his lips out and he'd do it very seductively mm. and he'd do it with unblinking eye contact but mm. it's kind of the soft kind of eye contact right and uh, he kind of would put his head side to side like kind of uh, inquisitively mm. everywhere in the world I think women understand the English word love oh yeah a few times the girls would say to their friend like he'd say I'm in love with you I'm, I'm in love with you and then the friend, she, the target would look to her friend and say, Tao Kim, what's why? Tao Kim, what's why, ma? Like they hear, he wants to make love with me. Yeah. But, you know, then I translate for him. They think you want to fuck him. Right. And then he's like, oh, she's already thinking about sex. She's already thinking about oh, sex. Nice. And he's like, yeah. no, no, no. I want to, I don't want to make love to you. I'm <laughs> in love with you. And this is the verbal content of his entire interaction. It's just like this whole, yeah. I'm in love with you. I'm in love with you. And then he just gets, it's almost like this dog uh, the horse whisperer we kind of we're like crocodile dundee where he looks at the girl mm. and then just sort of hypnotizes her with his eyes and his voice mm. and then they're making out like i remember like the third third time we we're hanging out i was on the phone 
with some girl at a, we were at a club and he was in front of me he was telling me some stuff i looked at my phone to check my text message and when i looked up after reading one text message hmm. he was making out with some girl like that they i didn't even <laughs> see her there <laughs> he's just sitting there making out with her <laughs> it wasn't that uncommon to have that happen hmm. the first time i hung out with him he got me kissing this girl in like 10 minutes hmm. at a club and then on the in the cab on the way home he's like when you fuck her you got to think, remember to thank me, remember to thank me when you fuck her. <laughs> and I'm like, whatever, whatever, right? I get home, it's 2 a.m., she texts me, mm. where are you? And I said, I'm at home. She's like, what's the address? <laughs> oh, my God. Right. Couldn't believe it. So I just went and mm. met her downstairs. And he was so right. Mm. So after that, I was like, dude, I get it. I'm going to hang out with this guy no matter what. Right. <laughs> and he was a rake all the way, all the way. So I just sort of copied that, integrated it into my identity and my style. And that became my, my, my main way of going about things. Wherever I went, it was just my go-to style. Corey, and that was like, what, 2005, 2000, where, where else was that? Yeah, 06, 07, 08. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah. one of the things you say in your course, which, you know, is all, all about this, is um, your strength is your desire. Mm-hmm. Is, so is it all about that? Is that what you would sum the rake up as? Yes. If you're not, maybe some of, some guys might not, like, have noticed this. If you're not horny, mm-hmm. or if you, if you have low testosterone, Mm. And you go out and try to meet women, like you're really tired because you, it was a Friday night, let's say, and you mm. work from 8 a.m. Mm-hmm. And you got no mojo, you got no, right. you know, no drive in your eyes. Like I've done this on nights I've, I worked really hard and then on, on work, I go out because I feel like I should go out. And I got nothing happening. I just get discouraged. And I realize just, it's just because I'm tired. I'm really, really tired. Mm. Like my, my, if I took a blood test, my T levels would probably be really low. Yeah. And that's a big part of it. Like, managing your biochemistry mm. so that you can call up this tremendous fountain of emotion mm. and energy uh, and okay. then you control it that's where the power is all at. right right yeah because i was going to talk to you about this because this is where i've been looking at it for a while is that it's like when, when you're doing this rake stuff you're kind of shining this light of your charisma of your emotions on the girl right and it's mm. this energy just kind of goes into her and mm. i got this idea from a natural friend of mine he was in like shanghai and he just had so much energy. He must have good genes or something. Uh, this guy mm. was like unstoppable. He would like party all night. He would like go all day working. And he just <laughs> had so much energy. It just made you jealous because he would never tire. He'd always be the last one in the party <laughs> still going. And every time he turned to a girl yeah, and he switched his energy on or guys, you know, or like the whole group, he would just kind of get them all like a bit more energetic and like get them, you know, get them to mm. like go get up and do stuff. And it was really like he was shining, he, you know, he just chose where to put this light, this light and shine mm. it on and, and it would kind of get like passed around. Is, is yes. that, can you relate to that? Is that something you think about it's too? It's something like that. I know a guy, one of my clients here is super high energy. I was just out with him Saturday night mm. and he was just unstoppable. Like, it, in fact, he's so loud mm. that he overpowers conversations in the near proximity. Like if I'm talking to a girl mm. and he just starts his thing everybody just looks at him and it's kind of cock blocking, mm. <laughs> you know, like, dude, tone it down. But he's drawing everybody in like fucking whirlwind <laughs> and he just picks girls up and they all want to get on him. And that's a style that is very effective, obviously, in certain venues. Yep. It's you. I would need to have that energy. Uh, that's the amount of energy that you would need to that that if you could call on, that would be mm. very powerful. Mm-hmm. But the rake energy is controlled. Okay. So it can't just be this wildfire like. Uh, like a scorched earth method, like <laughs> energy. It's more like Cyclops, mm. it's like the X-Men. <laughs> That's right. what I'm Because for me, I have relatively large eyes for an Asian guy. Mm. So I noticed that I can, I copied the Iranian dude just doing this hypnosis thing on girls just through eye contact, like a trance. If I widen my eyes and I can like try to dilate my eyes on purpose, like consciously, mm. just by opening up my eyes more and just thinking really horny thoughts. <laughs> I can dilate my pupils mm. and then it's my eyes are really wide. Girls have remarked to me many times that they didn't hear what I just said. Right. But they're looking right at my eyes, sort of like smiling in his trance look. Mm. So to me, it's the, the image I have is the Cyclops where he's he's got those laser beams coming out of his eyes mm. when every time he opens them. But he's got to control them or they're he's going to like kill people. You know what I mean? So it's sort of like that. Like I'm, I can't turn it on all the time because it's a limited resource. Mm. Energy is a limited resource. And if I, I'm 37, like if I right. was 25, maybe I could keep it going like loud, high energy stuff. Mm. I try to control it, have it sublimated so that when it comes out, it's just me and her. Like I don't need to draw attention to, to a group 
Mm. I'm just homing in on that one. And then I, you know, I could tell her, oh, I'm in love with you. I'm in love with you. Stop. No, come look at me. <laughs> and it just, the world fades away because it's just the two of us. Mm. And I think that's a different energy from the party guy right. or the frat guy, you know, who, who does keg stands and gets everybody involved. I try and, and I don't really and get and everybody involved. And it's more involved. efficient as well, like you're saying, yeah. right? Yes, so, so if yes. you don't have boundless energy, that's a better strategy. Yes. Yes. Okay, so this is what Robert Greene said in our interview about the rake, like how he likes to look at it. I just want you to see if you think of it this way or you look at it differently. He says, if you look at the rake, a simple way of looking at it and measuring it is like the degree to how much the person is obsessed with the woman. So if someone is just interested in sex and going to bed with 300 women, but it's kind of cold and they're doing it out of something else, that's not necessarily a rake. It's more the fact that this is a man who really, really is obsessed with women, their psychology, with who they are. <laughs> he really likes them deep down inside. He likes their company. He's not necessarily a man's man. In fact, most rakes have a slight feminine edge to them. Hmm. Yeah. Feminine edge. So he's just combining a bunch of different themes in that statement. Mm. One is that he's not just after sex, but he's at, he really he loves women. Yeah. Uh, uh, right. So because like the way I think about that, you know, there's some guys who are teaching dating advice in this kind of cold, hands off manner today. And if you look at the reports, some of them write stories and stuff. So they're sleeping with women, but, you know, it's very cold. Mm -hmm. And they're also getting, I find that these guys tend to be very negative about the whole experience and they tend to right. be more misogynist. And they're also like, they don't want to put very much time into it because they're not really enjoying it. You right. know, they just kind of like, want to get the lay and, and get it yes. out of the way. And even like, it seems like when they get the lay and they get it out of the way, they're not happy anyway, right? Oh, yes. I look at those guys and I read this and I'm like, well, yeah, like, because they don't really love the women at all and they don't even want to spend any time with them. Yeah. Guys like that could do the coquette style a lot better. The mm. rakes, he's right. The rakes, see, I'm just thinking about, it's like, I'm a fo full of emotions. So yeah, I like look backwards at what happens. And so it didn't occur to me about this loving women thing. I grew up with two sisters, so I've never hated women. Mm. And it's a really foreign thing to me. One of the things that I notice is when it, when it goes badly, sometimes it will go, the interaction might go wrong. Mm -hmm. When I get her back, the time when it goes wrong is when I get her back to the, my place. Mm -hmm. And if I go cold, like in terms of, I just want her for sex. And yeah. I, it's like 5 a.m. sex and you just want to sleep after. Right. <laughs> then it, it, the, the illusion that I was projecting to her mm -hmm. is like just crumbles. And then she kind of, she's really pissed. Mm -hmm. Right at the beginning, I was like, why are they so mad? They agreed to come back. We had sex, you know. But I realized now that with all of the desire that was going through my eyes and I was projecting that, you know, I'm in love with you kind of thing, mm. that they were expecting more. So I realized that this is a very powerful and dangerous tool if I don't use it responsibly. Right. right. And so one thing I started to do was mm. I, would, I would be more selective with the girls I bring back. But then yeah. I would also like go out for, supper, or for brunch in the morning or go for an early breakfast just so that. You know, I can let them down softly if I'm mm. not that interested. Mm. Or that would create a, a more permanent attachment. Mm. I was just picking on your point. You said, like, you were tired. And I'd say that that's kind of something important, too. It's happened to me, too. It's like, when, when you've been with this girl and you created, like, I'll give you an example. Of, right, when you're traveling and you meet this girl, it can often be, like, this big adventure, right? She meets you and it's all kind of crazy. Go around and do a whole bunch of things, say, during the day. And then you go back and you're having sex. But actually, like, a couple of times I've been so tired you know, because of traveling and everything and all my energy's gone and I'm, I'm like kind yeah. of half, like not even interested in it anymore. I just kind of want to go yeah. to sleep. And it's been the worst sex ever for both of us. You know, it's like yeah. been really after all the build up, which it was expecting yeah. to be this amazing thing. And then it's yes. just all, all, everything's gone out of it because we're probably both yes. really tired, not just me. Right. Yes. It's dangerous when you do that big build up to the sexual act mm -hmm. because there's almost like the building is so there's so much pressure. Yeah. Like that you, it's almost impossible to meet it. So I, if when I feel that happening, I just preemptive, just kind of surprise her, you know, more like I'll fuck her in the afternoon or something. Right, right. Like I, yeah, I don't want it to. Yeah, because I've, I've experienced that, you know, it's, you just can't live up to it. Because <laughs> you built up too much. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's that would that's accurate for the rate. But he said, so in that quote, he had something else there. Oh, yeah, the, the feminine, that yeah. there's a sort of feminine thing to it. Yes. So the rake is not going to have a lot of male friends. And that's something that I think is, you'll see this in common. Like, there's going to be a lot of jealousy. The, the rake should, more, he's an emotional guy. So in a way, that's already feminine, right? So he's indulging his emotions, sort of childlike. Mm. So I can be very 
childlike too. I can really get into desserts. I love desserts. Yeah, and I love that. girly. Pardon? <laughs> I've seen that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I love like girly stuff, like in, in the sense of like, I like to go to places with teddy bears. I don't know. It's like weird. Like, I like flowers. Uh-huh. I don't think I come across gay, but. Um, Not at all. Uh-huh. But yeah, I mean, like, I, because I don't know, I hang out with sisters. So I think that really helped the whole rake thing because I was surrounding mm-hmm. myself with women as much as I could. Mm-hmm. And, and getting used to, because like you say, I've seen you many times grab all these different cakes and stuff and put them on the table. And the girls are <laughs> like, this is awesome. You know? Yeah, <laughs> <They're>, right. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I think that's a, that's a part of it, part of being in the rake. It can also be the weakness. Like I've I've been in the in the new edition of the desire system. Mm. I added a component on neediness. Yeah, that's when you get your emotions take over. That you're not in control anymore, and and that's the feminine. That's the weakness of the feminine core. Like needing support, needing to be filled. Yeah, needing because you're empty and you need validation, or or you need right. somebody to fulfill you. Mm-hmm. Um, those are all very feminine things. And the rake, because he's got this feminine side, could easily fall into that trap. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. And you, just before we cover that, I, I don't want to forget this other thing. You said a lot of friends of his are girls. So what proportion mm-hmm. of your friends are girls versus guys? Well, uh, pretty much until last year, mm-hmm. uh, late last year, it was, well, see, I, I dated this sort of psychopathic girl as a challenge for myself. <laughs> And her duty, she kind of won in the last couple of years because she cut off all my, so many female friends. And before uh, that, it was all female friends. I'd roll into mm, a club with just female friends. Mm, like I had, there was this cute girl down the hall from my, in my condo. And we were totally platonic, but we were like sister, brother, but she was pretty hot. And so everyone was like, oh, Dave's sleeping with her. But I wasn't, you know, we we're just friends. Mm, and this ex just cut her off. And there were so many of those. So when you cut out my female friends, I'm left with very few friends, actually. <laughs> you know, there are other guys like yourself, you know, but because of my nature of like loving desserts, getting really excitable mm. about just, I proactively just try to surround myself with women, made it so that it was, I naturally didn't have as many male friends. But I've discovered that you, you need balance in life. Yeah. And the rake's weakness, I might as well, uh, it's not a necessary weakness. This neediness and this feminine Nature is mm. not a necessary part of being a rake. You can call up the desire and the emotion and love women mm. and it express sexual desire just as strongly if you're a manly man. Right. So I've been doing a lot more of like survival things, um, mm. like survival trips, mountain trips, and just doing a lot more fitness and just working out. In, in Singapore, it's really hot and tropical area. And I've been working out in a gym with no air conditioning, very little lighting, just like hardcore mm. lifting and stuff. And it's raising my testosterone quite a lot. Yeah. And it's great. It's like getting in, more in touch with my masculinity mm. as a good corrective to years and years of being a rake. Right. So would you say that's something you have to do? Are you still going to be mm. a rake with this testosterone or is it, is well, it going to okay. change your approach? A bit? Here's, oh yeah, this is great to actually discuss this. Mm. This is a very specialized, like a master level thing about the rake. Yeah. <laughs> and it's in, you find this in Asian history. Mm. A great depiction of this is the movie Emperor and the Assassin with Zhang Ziyi and Gong Li. Mm-hmm. I think Zhang Ziyi is in it. Anyway, the emperor's mother in the old the Shuji, the old accounts of history, the actual chronicles, said that his mother was so horny, she was fucking all the ministers, <laughs> like all the officers. And it was just a disgrace to him. Mm. It's like, I have to do something. They're like, the minister in waiting said, you have to do something about your horny mother. Mm. <laughs> so they scoured the land and found this dude with a huge penis <laughs> who apparently walked through the village strapping a tie, like a wheel to his penis and just walking through the village like that. So they got this hung Chinese dude and put him, gave him to the queen mother. Mm. And he just satisfied her and apparently she stopped fucking other dudes. But then she had two babies by this big dick guy, right? Mm. So in the movie, it's a great depiction of this interesting dynamic where he launches a rebellion against the king. Mm. And the king heads it off and kills him and kills the kids. And uh, what's interesting, though, is his style is he's super feminine. Like, if you were to watch this movie, mm. you watch the movie, you'll see that their depiction of the big dick guy is that he's almost, he's very gay. Mm. Like, he paints his face white. He has a very high-pitched voice. He has all of these feminine hand movements, like the Chinese opera kind of thing. And then he has a scene when he's doing the rebellion. He launches, like, runs into the, the court with the sword, and he's very manly then. So it's like 
you it's sort of like Russell Brand, like you you present this feminine front, yeah, but inside you're a killer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's just a, an act, like Prince. Right. Uh, you know, like you can imagine this guy when he behind closed doors, he mm. probably like pushes, like pulls women's hair, like yeah. really dominant, right, sexually. Mm. But you know, in the video, he's like this yeah. flamboyant gay dude, like trans. Well, that's guy. true. Russell Brand always like always comes off as very feminine. You lull them into like the sort of complacency; they let their guard down, mm. <laughs> and then when they don't expect it, oh, there's this huge penis in you. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like they didn't think it'd be coming. So that was sort of that's like the. The, the feminine part of the rake, and you see mm. this in the dandy too, like this ambi- right. ambiguous ambigu- ambiguity in the sexual uh, identity mm. is just a device, really. Because mm. the core has to be masculine or there will be no attraction. Mm. There will be no sexual attraction. So the masculine core is about knowing your purpose or your passion mm. and getting really, really good at that and mm. finding fulfillment in that. It can't involve women. Mm. And you can be on the outside, you can dress feminine, you can talk feminine, you can have feminine hand movements, mm. but if you're doing your thing and that's the most important thing to you and you're a killer about it, you know, like you're, you're ruthless in pursuing your own passions, mm. then that is going to be incredibly attractive and it's, you're going to be able to incorporate both sides, right? Mm. You could you get all the benefits of, of being the feminine, you know, gay guy that she can relate to, has lots yeah. of fun with, can let her hair down with, and then, oh, there you are when she needs sex, mm. sex, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you can provide that. So, too. like, I think guys listening to this, they might think that, you can't be two people. You can't be these kind of two different people. But you know, I can imagine from your perspective, it's really not not really that complicated, right? <clears throat> right. It's, it's like when you're at work mm-hmm. versus you're in a club. You're two. Well, I think most people can relate to that. It's like when you're at work, you can be this really serious guy getting mm-hmm. stuff done, right? And right, then taking right. responsibilities. Then you go to the club, you relax, you're having fun, and you're a completely different person. If, if they saw both of those people in front, because I know like uh, girls in the mm. past, have, when they've got to know me a bit and they've seen me at work, they're like, wow, you're so serious, right? And it's kind of shocking to them, like when they see me in a work mode versus, you know, when they mm. met me just playing around, messing around all the time. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, but it is, it's, it's, uh-huh. it's like, it's it's not really difficult to get into access different emotions is kind of the point I'm getting. Maybe at first I'm thinking about kind of the newer guys who aren't you kind of used to this material. It may be harder to access their emotions, and I guess that's what your system is a yeah. bit more about as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you never want to be one dimensional mm. and predictable and boring. Mm. So presenting different sides of yourself is great, and I don't want people to think it's like at sometimes you're one way, at sometimes you're another. Mm. This is all consistent. Mm. I think it's when you think about it very simplistically, mm. that you think either you're always uh, aggressive and mean or something, mm-hmm. or dominant, like in a, in a, right. in a very strong way, or mm. you're always soft. Mm. Right? So in the West, we have a rake tradition um, of the Don Juan stories and Casanova stories. Mm. And in, in Asia, the only tradition of ladies' men is the rake, the dandy rake. Mm. So like Jia Baoyu in, in Dream of the Red Chambers, The Pillow Book, Sei Shonagon, Tale of Genji, mm. all of these guys, because they were upper class, like even in upper class Europe, the courtiers had to wear, wear wigs and they painted their faces, mm. you know, and, and they had to speak in relatively feminine language and so on. They weren't warriors who were sweating and killing people out in the fields. Mm. And, but that didn't stop them from when they were, needed to get something done. They just got it done. Mm. And that's the masculine part of it. So, like, your style on the external style could be feminine, but the internal core is still going to be, I get stuff done. And I, I know what I want to get done, and I go and get it done. Yeah. And that's the masculine part of it. That's what they'll respond to as well. Yeah. And like you're saying, it's more like, you know, we all have these emotions, all of these various different emotions in us, right? These different aspects to us. And mm-hmm. it's more about letting them out. I think that's kind of what makes the difference. It seems like I wanted to get into this a bit. It's like, like if you look at, if, if you look at some of the guys who get come into this dating advice realm, right? Often, I think they've kind of withdrawn from a lot of their emotions because of rejection, bad experiences with women and so on. So they kind of close off some of those emotions. I think, I think a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And some of the guys also, as they get more into dating advice, they also take on this more controlling mindset, right? So it's like, I'm going to control everything and yeah. they get a bit colder and, and less emotional. How does that compare to the way you look at it? I mean, is that a problem? Have you seen that as well? And yeah, I think, so you mean like guys get hurt and so they withdraw emotionally over time yeah. and it becomes such a second part of their, part of themselves as a second nature. Yeah. Yes, like this emotional withdrawal makes you into like a social robot. And I think at that point, it becomes very difficult for you to attract women. You'd have to go with the traditional means of amassing money and status 
and just getting, I don't know, plastic surgery to look good because you're not going to be attracting women emotionally <laughs> because you have no emotions. So yeah, if you go cold emotionally, I, I don't think there's very, you might be able to try a, like a cocky funny style, mm. maybe, um, but you're very, it's going to be very limited, your options. Right. Because I, I mean, I do see some guys when they get into this controlling uh, approach, they do, they do get some result. Like some of them can get pretty, pretty good results, I think. I've seen a few of them. However, what I think happens is that it negatively impacts their level of happiness. They don't seem to get happier with it. In fact, and if anything, they kind of go the other way and they seem, even if they are getting like meeting girls and kind of getting results from like, getting laid from it, right? They don't really have relationships. So maybe they just get laid, some of those guys. I so think, controlling, like they, they think that they get off on being able to control a girl? I, yeah, like, well, like, like control the situation, I, I think. Mm. And it's, it tends to be the ones who kind of, like you say, a bit more like social robotic, right? So they kind of, it's kind of like, do this, do that, do that. And oh, it, it, make, okay. it makes so they're more it makes, Machiavellian. Right, right. And yeah, and, okay, and they, they, they are very kind of, they, they have this cold, misogynist, kind of Machiavellian side to it, I guess. Well, you know, we all kind of do. Mm. Like, if you to get good at this, right. you kind of have to be detached, especially mm. at the beginning. Because you, you can't get too attached to any one woman. I mean, that's right. part of the rake strength. I, I think I might be deviating from your main point here, but just mm. pointing yeah. out like the. The rake feels strongly, mm. and, and, and I guess like that word Robert Greene used, obsessed, is very, I think it's like dangerous because obsession usually means you're thinking about this one girl to the exclusion of all else, mm. and that's not what the rake is, that's not what an effective rake is doing. Because if, if a rake is doing that, then he's just a needy right. guy. A, a, a rake would be someone who is overwhelmed emotionally in terms of his desire and so on when he's in the presence of that one girl, mm. but when she leaves... He's not, he, he might be immediately feeling the same thing towards another girl. Like he's mm. just always liking girls. Mm. And um, he's never completely attached or obsessed with any one girl to the exclusion of all others. And if he is, it's just for, it's very temporary. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I'm in love with you, but I'm in love with her too. And I'm in love with her too. And, right. And yeah. So I don't know, maybe you remember this guy. Do you remember this guy called Mr. Sex NYC? Mr. Sex for you mm. NYC. He is like, this is like 15 years ago. I mean, On ASF? A long time ago. He, yeah, um, ASF way back. And he, he's familiar. like the kind of guy I guess I'm talking about. I think he might, he, he definitely gave off this kind of investment banker very hard. Mm. And he was super controlling. He was always like, as soon as a girl did anything he, he kind of felt was a little bit negative, he'd boot them out of his life. Yes. Okay, I have some very effective clients like that. Mm. <laughs> I have this one guy I call him Iceman. He's very effective. <laughs> <laughs> Ice cold, man. Yeah. Ice man. But is he happy uh, too? Can you, can, you give, can you give that perspective? He's, and is he is yes, it only that or is he accessing his emotions he's as trying, well? Yeah, I think he's, it was through his player phase. So that lasted like a year or so, mm. a couple of years. And now he's trying to soften up. Yeah. I think he's just feeling a little lonely or something. You know what? I think a rake needs a little bit of that, mm. that detachment. Mm. Because it's very, it's very easy to go over emotional. That's why I inserted yeah. this new segment in the new desire system on mm. on controlling that neediness. Yeah. A lot of guys I notice who are beginners have a lot of neediness and can't, if they're emotional like me, they can't control their emotions. And mm. the overpowering emotion is, I need a woman to complete me. I need <laughs> you to like me for me to feel good about right, myself. Right, right. And those are very repellent emotions. So you, mm. if you end up, if that's your dominant emotion while you're talking to a girl, it's going to be, even if you're doing sexual state transfers and all the techniques mm. I teach you, mm -hmm. you're going to be transferring very repellent emotions to her and you'll get a very strong negative reaction mm. but if you can control the neediness so for guys like myself who are naturally more uh, love like we have big hearts and we you know yeah it's easier for us to fall in love you could use a little bit of that ice ice man kind of thing mm. <laughs> but mm. yeah some guys who are for whatever reasons are emotionally detached they're not going to be experiencing the fullness of life you know mm. and at some point they're going to wonder you know, what's this all for? Right. Like you've kind of outlined a bit, right? Some guys, they get cold at the beginning. They kind of realize something's missing and then they start more, more getting softer and warmer as they get better at this. Mm-hmm. So, right. Okay. So I kind of want to take advantage of the fact that you're an academic and you kind of know that world a bit. Is, uh, mm. it's, it's always get, good to get to the science. So, you know, we're talking a lot about emotions and how they affect women. Yes. And like, what do you feel about this kind of state of the art or science right now yeah. as to the proof as to, you know, if this is really relevant or not? And we're not just talking about opinions here. People who doubt the truth of emotional transference, I don't even know what world they're in. I mean, mm. this is so well understood 
and documented it. I've mm. seen it. I've come across it in so many pop science books that are just reporting the reports of reports of reports, which are like, this is just, it's so common knowledge that you don't even need to cite anything anymore. The existence of mirror neurons is just, just, just assumed, you know, like you don't even need to argue for it. You don't even need to what, have a citation for mm -hmm. the proof of it. It's just. Mm -hmm. So quickly, the, quickly, just so mm -hmm. you know, people know what the mirror oh, neuron right. concept is. Okay. Right. So these are certain neur these are neurons in the brain and they're, they are in older parts of the brain, brain stem area, the motor activation area, like in the middle part of the brain. Mm. And basically what they, what they do is, uh, their function is to help us feel and detect what other human beings and animals are feeling. Mm. We were much better at reading the emotions of, of human beings, but it works for anybody with a face <laughs> and a brain. So we've evolved this because we need to make split second decisions about mm. whether the person is a threat mm. you know, or a friend. So it's you know, fight or flight. Yeah. And if we stand there and have to calculate consciously all of the cues, we'd probably be, be dead, mm. you know, because we we're, were too slow. Mm. So the, the human beings or the, the homo sapiens that had this in their brain and they had a distinct advantage and we've been we have that passed down. Mm. So we are able to detect other emotions by feeling the same emotions that the person we're looking at has. Yep, yep. And that's how we detect it. Mm -hmm. The use here's a quick way to use mirror neurons. If you're looking at a girl and you want to, and, and you're feeling very sexually aroused, mm. you just need to make sure she doesn't. You distract her logical mind. You distract her prefrontal cortex from what's going on in the rest of her brain. Yeah. So you arouse yourself <laughs> while looking right into her eyes mm -hmm. and talk about something else. So you distract her, and then slowly you just let the mirror neurons take hold. And it could be as quick as thirty seconds, you know, a minute, and she'll start to feel it. And she won't know why because it's unconscious. So she'll be looking at your face and getting aroused sexually. And she won't know why. She'll just assume you're really sexy. And she'll want you. And that's how, it's work that's how it works. <laughs> it sounds like magic, but it's science. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It's, it's science. Now, one of the things I wanted to mention when we were talking about this before we started the interview, um, yep. in getting feedback from the desire system I, and sort of the neediness thing. And one of the issues is that guys have trouble projecting sexual state because they feel like there's this like sinfulness or there's like this dirtiness and and they think these women don't want to feel sexually right. like they, they don't think sexual thoughts yeah because there are these horrible studies with no basis whatsoever that like men think about sex every seven minutes and right. women think about sex like once a day or something that there's no such study that actually says that i don't even know where that came from mm. actually women are just as respond just as strongly or more to visual stimuli as men do sexually mm. There's a, a pioneer scientist who works at Queen's University, the Sage Lab, Meredith Shivers, who's created or developed this instrument, the plasmograph, mm -hmm. which is a, a kind of bulb that detects blood flow and, and basically can tell when you insert it in the vaginal canal mm -hmm. can tell how aroused a woman is. And when the, the series of tests showing women various kinds of stimuli, including male, male sex, female, uh, straight sex, uh, female, female sex, Bonobos fucking, an erect penis, naked guy walking on the beach. And, mm. and then in between each of these scenes, they, they show a, like a landscape. So they go back to zero, you know, baseline. Mm. Men are aroused. You know, they have the fMRI scanner. They have the penis pump kind of thing. Yeah. So the, the men are aroused by what they expect to be aroused by. Straight men are only aroused by female, female porn and female male porn. They're not aroused by looking at bonobos fucking. If you're a guy listening to this, you totally understand why. <laughs> Women, however, have shown arousal across the board. Like, they're aroused by everything. Mm. They're aroused by bonobos fucking. And they, but on the keypad, they'll say, no, I'm not aroused. So they, they're confounding. They're not even, they don't even know. Either they're lying, or more probably, they're not con they have no conscious access to that. Or they're socially co programmed or socially conditioned not to say so. Right. So kind of they're covering it up, even though it's in, yes. in the study. Yeah. Even, yeah, though they, they, um, even though they feel slightly aroused, you're saying that they're lying in the data. Yeah, right. They're confounding. Now, right. we don't know if it's conscious or not. So the point is this. Women are horny. Mm. And <laughs> women are very sexual creatures. Mm. And women can have four times more types of orgasms than men can. Mm. Women are much e also able to achieve multiple orgasms much e more easily than men can. Mm -hmm. and, and so on. I mean, like, just they're sexual creatures. And they want to feel sexually. So when you're presenting this i mean this is cutting edge science from neuropsychology they want to be aroused they're looking for that from their knight in shining armor don't think that they're these 
are virtuous princesses that never think about sex, right? They mm -hmm. are just as sexual as we are, and they will welcome it. And they're looking for that. Go read Fifty Shades of Grey, and you'll see it. <laughs> All right, right. So yeah, that is an um, interesting book. It's worth yeah, reading. Yeah. Yes. Did you read the whole trilogy? No, I've I've read half of the first one. How it's kind of tough going as a guy, right? Yeah. Because you're inside some girl's head, and it's weird. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I learned a lot there. Uh, worth reading for sure so we're talking about the science here like we're talking kind of like the data versus the surveys a little bit and you know you just pointed out the basically like what the data is saying because now you're talking about some studies that have really kind of focused on data what is the physical changes that are taking place in the brain and in the yes. vagina and stuff versus what the surveys have, have kind of said to date and a lot of the yes. surveys say what do you think about the surveys and, and kind of like the research on sexuality yeah so most of the research so if you've even read the research based on the surveys, you're already ahead of the game. Right? Mm -hmm. So I applaud you for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most people have not. And they're completely ignorant of evolutionary psychology. Mm -hmm. But what's going on in the field is that a lot of the evolutionary psychology is being uh, in the sexual in sexuality mm -hmm. mating is being overturned by the research findings in neuropsychology mm -hmm. and in sexology with the plasmograph and other types of research along those lines. The old research in evolutionary psychology have been based on self-reporting. So you just ask a girl, what do you like in a man? And she just looks at a piece of paper mm. and either writes it down or checks it off or orders them in priority. So this is all looking at the prefrontal cortex, like just depending on her, knowing what she likes. I think anybody who spent any time picking up women <laughs> would know that what they say often is not what they're really feeling. Mm -hmm. And most of the time it's not conscious. They're not purposely doing that. Yeah. They just don't have conscious access to what they're really feeling. So this is why emotional contagion is so effective with women, because they're so blind to what's happening, actually, in their unconscious. So do you want me to continue on, on the surveys? And no, we just want to get a view of what you think, because we were talking about it earlier. You were kind of saying there's a change like taking place at the moment, and there's a bit of conflict in the scientific community, because you have oh, this data yes. versus like That's the right. surveys. And, yeah. and you also said that people are still trying to publish this kind of survey-based data, and it's not mm. very rigorous. Yeah, right. Like, I'm involved with some cutting-edge research in evolutionary psychology, co-authoring papers and so on. My academic background, my PhD was in philosophy and in religion mm. and in Asian, Asian history. Uh, so now I'm seeing it from the psychology side, and I see that there's a lot of finessing of mm. the results. There's a lot of massaging of the results there's, to mm. get the desired result. And it's right. pretty easy to manipulate data, mm. actually, mm. and statistics and so on. So especially with just surveys and reporting, uh, it's easier to manipulate that than, than scientific data, you know, like the natural sciences. Yeah. One of the results of basing your conclusions on surveys for the past 40 years, which is what evolutionary psychology has been doing, is that there's this mi very misleading theory called the parental investment theory that is the dominant theory in evolutionary psychology when it comes to mating. And the theory basically is that women invest, have to invest a lot more in parenting, in, in childbirth, than men do. So that would dictate a different mating strategy. They should, if they're rational, uh, be looking for a stable, dependable, long-term mate who is high in resources and status, because that will ensure more resources and more money and food yeah. for their children. So they should never engage in slutty behavior. I mean, like, slutty is a, is a negative word. So they should never engage in short-term mating behavior. So evolutionary psychologists have been puzzled over why women are engaged in short-term mating, and they have to posit all these different theories to explain it, given their adherence to the parental investment theory. So the new results from, from the plasmograph studies, from all the neuropsychology and, and sexology, from the natural sciences, uh, turn that on its head, that women are, are sexual creatures. We've evolved to have emotional lives and emotional connections for short periods of time. I mean, lifespans in 50,000 years ago was like, the life expectancy for a male was less than 30 years for women was, what, 35? And now we're living to 70, 80, 90, and so on. We're not really evolved and equipped to deal with that level of commitment. So you're seeing when once society lets people get divorces relatively easily, people will take advantage of that. Um, and you're seeing the dissolution of family structures and so on because people get horny and they want to fuck other people. This goes right alongside the new views on how evolution impacts or helps us understand mating strategies. Just the, the takeaway, the simple, simple takeaway, women are as horny as we are. They enjoy sex as much or more than we do. So give it to them. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's what they want. It's great. Well, f- thanks for that update, man, because I know you're like further into the scientific world than a lot of the people yet on this show. So it's, it's really nice to get mm. uh, a kind of update where things stand because, you know, people mm. are reading about evolutionary psychology, of course, a lot. And so it's good to hear that some of the mm. data is proving some of that wrong. And so we get that right. Now, yeah. we're talking a lot about getting in touch with your emotions, basically. So part of becoming a rake is getting more in touch with your emotions. What are some of the requisites to this? So some of the things... I was thinking about like for guys who haven't had many relationships, is it easy to do this? To getting in touch with your emotions? Yeah. It's well, it's never easy to actually get in touch with them. It's easy. If you're a naturally emotional guy like myself, you'll have emotions. Mm. The trick is knowing when you're having them, Mm. what they are, that you're, what it is that you're exactly feeling, Mm. naming the emotion that takes, helps you take control over it and being able to control the emotional expression Mm. that those are all relatively difficult. We talked a little bit about some methods for training yourself mm. to be more emotionally aware, more emotionally intelligent. Right. And a, a big part of that is being able to calm yourself to see the flow of thoughts in your mind as they go by, mm. kind of more dispassionately. Yeah. Um, so meditation is really, really good in this regard. Mm-hmm. And I would say also, if you, the more cognitive behavioral therapy, especially the cognitive side, the better off you will be. If you know how to question, if you know how to identify automatic thoughts and then question them and then change them, you're going to be a very, very proactive, self-actualized person who will be able to manipulate emotions much more adeptly. And you'll have a, a just a more happy life. That's great. So, I mean, I mean, I know that in the desire system, you kind of have this long process, which you take people through and a big part of that to mm-hmm. uh, go through that whole self-awareness and, and thing. I wanted to talk a bit about some of the kind of outside things like do in the general, because for instance, you see Russell Brand, he, he does a lot of yoga and spirituality. Mm-hmm. You see, I know that you mentioned in your course, positive psychology as well. And then of course, counseling and therapy, which one of these things kind of in mainstream world do you think is like valid and useful? Oh, in the mainstream world. I think all of them are. Mm. Yoga is relatively easy to learn. Mm. I first did yoga through P90X, Yoga X. Yeah. <clears throat> Have you done then, Kundalini, uh, by the way? Like, no, if, okay. I haven't. I just saw, I, yeah, I was, I just saw a Kundalini yoga retreat in Bali. Right. I was thinking about going to do yeah, that. One of my friends, she just started a place in Malibu. I, oh. I was reading up on it. And it, it sounds like, you know, you want it for this purpose, like the mind and, you know, kind of your emotional side. It sounds like it's the one to really get into. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And you can, you can get in good shape that way. <laughs> yeah, of course. Too. Mm. Physical. Yeah. And then the cognitive therapy. I'm just a big fan of that. So, yeah, all around. So that's it. I mean, when you say cognitive therapy, is it that's counts? That's kind of counseling. Yeah, you can yeah. learn to counsel yourself. <laughs> so, ah, okay. Uh, the basis of the the therapeutic approach I take in the mm. desire system mm. in uh, confronting your limiting beliefs, reframing them, and so on, mm. conditioning has its basis in cognitive behavioral therapy, mm. which is the most proven method of therapy, uh, talk therapy in in the world right now. Right. So you can get Beck's book. It's, a, it's just a classic cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm-hmm. It's not a very inventive title, but <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, it's a, it's a great book. And basically what you're doing there is this, the same thing that the Stoics and the Buddhists have been doing for thousands of years. Mm. You're, you're, in order to change your emotions, you have to question the interpretations that are causing the emotion. So it's a matter of identifying the emotion, then asking yourself what thoughts led to this emotion, and then questioning whether those thoughts are accurate, mm-hmm. they're true, whether they're rational thoughts. You know, and then questioning that and, and, and just, that's what I call psychological archaeology. You just mm. keep asking the why question, is this, is this accurate? Why do I feel this right. way? What are the right. reasons? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I feel like your program, like I said in my review of it, as like it's a very mature program and quite advanced from that perspective because it's really demanding uh-huh. to take it, you know, to, mm. to the, the high level in terms of self-awareness. And it's doing this work on yourself to become a better person as well and more aware of yourself and, you know, communicating better. So it's quite, I mean, I'd say it's one of the most advanced things I've oh, read. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, most of this is all work that you do in your study room. Mm-hmm. So it's not advanced when you go out into the field. Like it's super simple. Yeah. And as far as the system goes, when mm-hmm. you're talking to women, mm-hmm. all the complex work is done at your right. computer or at your desk. Mm-hmm. So there, I assume... All my readers or all, you know, everyone's watching is really intelligent and hardworking, <laughs> you know, because there's really no excuse mm. for, for any laziness there. Yeah, I felt like it, it is a program that takes quite a bit of effort to, to get through. Mm. It's not going to be one of these magic 
just pick up a book for five seconds or like a few minutes and yeah, you know, it just works. So you have to do, you have to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. It rewards every page study. Mm. Uh, but I think everything in life worth mm. having is right. difficult to achieve. Yeah. Otherwise you would already have it yeah. or everybody else would have it. Yeah. So, but the, I try to make it as simple as possible when you get, see the, the difficult part you can do at home because you can just watch the video and just, just follow along in that way. Mm. But when you're out talking to women, I mean, you can't just turn on the video and say, hold on, girl, let me check this thing out. Okay, this is what I yeah. should say next, right? right? You don't want a complex system mm. to apply when you're out in the field. Well, uh, no, because you're your, field, yours is all about like learning basically to kind of master your emotions, right? Like that. If you yeah, want to kind of say right. it in one phrase, I guess that would be, and you know, you're doing this homework and then when you, when you go out, it's kind of like it's been internally done, right? So you just have to remember mm. a couple of little basic things. Is that, is that how it works? Yeah, exactly, right, right. Mm. exactly. All right, man. So one of the f- topics I know is kind of a bit more conflictual you talk about is uh, confidence. And, mm-hmm. you know, you talked about like different ways that people try to be confident because everyone like, you know, we, we've heard thousands of times that you have to be confident. Women attracted to confidence. Mm-hmm. But of course, like it's one of these concepts, which is like, OK, but what does that mean? You know, and, uh, like guys always complain when they first hear this, like, OK, but what, what does mm-hmm. conf- confident really mean? What's your kind of take on that? I'd always wondered why women like a confident guy because mm. I, I had trouble back then when I first started out understanding the difference between confidence and just being arrogant or having bravado mm. or something. Mm. So when it comes down to it, confidence is a belief in yourself mm. that you can get shit done, that you can take care of yourself, that you, it's basically like a root level self-reliance and self-efficacy. Yeah. And that has to be earned, right? So like it would be a false confidence if you just kept repeating to yourself, I am confident, I am confident, I am confident. <laughs> That's not going to actually build confidence. And so let, before I get into how you build it, just point out like the reason why women are most attracted to a confident man is because if you display confidence, if they detect confidence in you, then they assume that there's a good reason for that. Mm-hmm. And they assume then that you can, if you can take care of yourself, then you can take care of other people. And mm-hmm. they need uh, the feminine essence is to, to be supported, to look for support, yeah. to lean on you know, the, the rock or whatever, to lean on something stronger. Uh, so they're looking for that. If you're doubting yourself, if you always need somebody else to complete you, if you're, if you're looking to women to tell you you're worthy, mm. then this is a big turnoff. And that's why neediness is, is, such a, is the ultimate turnoff. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, so anyway, to build confidence, the, the, the most effective way is, is also the most effective way of building your masculine essence of, of bringing that out. And it's basically to to find your purpose, or if you're younger, you can just think about what you're passionate about, and then find flow in that activity, Mm -hmm. and and just get really, really good at it to the point where you're proud of your achievement in that area. And it can be completely, it should be actually completely unrelated to women. It shouldn't be about women. Right. And so that's what will build your self-confidence, and and that's really attractive. Now, at the most root, at the most basic level, self-reliance should be like survival, like that you know... No matter what, you're going to be okay. Yeah. You're going to get through this. And you have to, sometimes I'm, we're missing that rite of passage. I was just talking about this with, with one of our mutual friends, like the, the guy I was just mentioning to you when we started, right? Yeah. Just came into town. We're talking about like how there's no, I mean, for modern men, we don't have that rite of passage or those wars. We never mm. fought these wars. Like this is a fight club theme, you know? Mm. And especially in Singapore, you see this a lot in, in more, what's the word, uh, like very safe, civilized, totally. sterile nations that, that men are kind of babied and they never were pushed to the extreme. Mm. They don't have the self-reliance. Mm. Uh, and then they blow these first world problems up into something really big. Right. So mm-hmm. like one of the things I've been thinking about for a while, I don't know if you've been thinking about this, is have you done any martial arts or anything, yeah, or any fighting? Yeah. So I've been thinking that that's, that's a key thing I need to do. When, when I get a bit more time, mm-hmm. I'm going to like go on some of these boot camps around the world and, and stuff and, and learn a few yeah. different arts. Yeah, totally. Because like of I, what it does to your mind. Yes. Yeah, I, I did a junior black belt in Taekwondo mm. when I was 14. And then I've been doing quite a, yeah, I've been doing quite a lot of fitness. And like I was saying earlier about just rediscovering my masculine essence and building right. on that. And lifting, lifting heavy helps as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, lifting. Because that's uh, a challenge in itself, in right? When you're lifting heavy versus light, you've got this mental challenge part yes. to it. I don't know if you've been for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pushing through the pain. Yeah. Uh, looking for the pain because you need to hit that pain point in order to grow yeah, your exactly. muscle. Mm. But even oh, one of my, my most transform, transformational experiences was last year, I did a trip through Vietnam on a motorcycle. 
mm. in seven days. Did I tell you about this? No, I Seven day motorcycle trip. Mm. Went with five guys and a guy, a really cool guy. We went through some very, very dangerous roads on mm. the mountains. Mm. And you can imagine there's no railings. You know, it's Vietnam. It's not very developed. Not developed at all. So there's railings and it's a one way street, both, you know, just one lane each way. And there are lots of blind turns and trucks just overtaking each other and just, you know, horrible third world traffic. Mm. And it's just like a straight drop down, drop off on, on one side and then a cliff on the other. And there's some really steep uphills and downhills. Mm. I had not ridden a motorcycle. Like I had, I had six hours of training on a closed track on mm. a dirt trail before I went on this thing. And we started in Hanoi and just drove out. And like on the first day I was already, I fell under a moving steamroller that went over the front of my bike. Oh, wow. And then uh, like that was, that was the trip. Like the first four days... I, I would um, risk my life like at least three or four times a day where I, I almost died. Like I got into a head-on collision where the, the, the other guy's scooter went right into my chest Ooh. as I was flying forward. And I got pinned between his bike and mine. Luckily, Ouch. I had a back plate on, so I uh-huh. didn't break my spine or anything. But um, I had to postpone my tattoo because I had this huge bruise from the, right. the, the scooter tire. Anyway, like there was a day when there was a mudslide. So a four-hour ride turned into a nine-hour ride. So there's this mudslide and no the total cloud, so there's no moonlight. So if you turn your bike off, it's pitch black. Right. And we're on the side of a mountain with an incline. There's a straight drop off, but we can't even see it. And our, our headlights suck. Like you can see to right. the side, but you can't mm-hmm. see it in front. <laughs> and there's a point where we all got separated. And I was on my own at a fork in the road. I turned my bike off and it was totally pitch black. Like I couldn't see a fucking thing. Mm-hmm. I pulled out my phone. It was the only light source. No one was picking up their phones. No one was on the WhatsApp group. And um, like, shit, like it's 830. The sun had set like three hours ago. I mean, who God knows where. But I was I was like, that was one of the happiest moments of my life, man. I realized I am alive. Like right. I got my four limbs. Sure, I'm in the middle of this mud that's up to my knees. But if worse comes to worse, I can sleep on the side of the road. Hope yeah. no one runs into me. And, you know, I got 70 percent battery. And that was like one of those things where I don't need even like my, my lifestyle in Singapore is quite good. Like. But I don't need a fancy condo. I don't need girls. I don't need money. I don't need, you know, all the shit. Like I have on myself, I have enough cash. I got, you know, I got these skills. I got these language skills, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Like I can survive. And that was just another example, like just teaching me, even if I lose everything that the yeah. world thinks is important, I'm fine. And that's self-reliance, man. I used to teach the castaway example. Mm. And but like before you go, I mean, it's yeah. having these experiences which makes all the difference because we can read about self-reliance mm. and yes. we can study it. And hopefully that incites us to do the sorts of things that you've just been talking <laughs> about, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it, once we learn about it and we're like, okay, this is important. I, it needs to be part of my life. Then you start doing more of these things that you were just talking about, which actually you know, you know, make it concrete in your life and you get to feel it. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. I mean, that, that's an mm-hmm. awesome example. I totally get the feeling, but it's, it's hard to describe. Yeah. It's a bit like yeah, stoicism. I don't know if some of the guys have read about stoicism or if you've read about stoicism. It's, mm-hmm. it's all this great Greek Cicero, philosophy about letting go of everything. Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. Yeah. So it it, it yes. does get pretty deep. And yeah, every man should read Aurelius's book. It, oh, so I used to teach this example of Castaway. Like, mm-hmm. You know, the Tom Hanks movie? Yeah. stuck on this island by mm. himself like mm-hmm. for four years or whatever. Yeah. Like, what would you do? Like, if you can reach the emotional point, like this, so go, this goes back to the Iceman example, like yeah. the, the tension in the rake. Yep. And I cover a little bit of this in the old desire system, but a lot more in the new. You need to reach the advanced level of the rake is where you reach this emotional point where mm. if you lose everything, like you're on this island all by yourself, yep. are you going to be okay? Like you're not going to be elated or really happy, but are you going to mm. be okay? I used to teach this, but I never actually... I've never lived on a deserted island, you know, I was just like, I knew theoretically that that is true, but I've never had to confront that because I've never been right. in a war. I've never really had to put my life in the yeah. line for anything. So this bicycle trip, the motorcycle trip was like the closest I got to that. And man, it was so liberating mm. and it was, it was so powerful. If anybody, you know, if you can do a survival camp, mm. boot camp or, or one of those Navy SEALs week, week long boot camps or something, mm. I highly recommend right. trying that. And like, I'm just thinking to like get the guys to see what we're talking about, Clear. I mean, this is really kind of the, the, everything that was behind Fight Club, right? The movie Fight Club. 
Because, yeah, you know, you right. see, like, he's, he's like, all your emotions are dulled down and nothing really seems big. Mm. They actually do it in the film where the audio is turned down. He's in the office and he can't really hear the guy yelling at him, right? <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like that because yeah. it's no big deal. It's like, what's he saying, you know? Yes, exactly. Right. And it does yeah. tend, it, it puts things into perspective. That, that's what it yeah. does. Yeah. And at the beginning, that whole IKEA lifestyle, you know, mm. first world problems. Yeah, exactly. So good movie. If you haven't seen it, you'd, it'd be pretty amazing if you haven't seen it, but you should definitely yeah. watch that if you have an awesome movie. All right, yes. man. So, oh, man, this, this has been an awesome interview as usual. Before you go, I want to get the usual question out that uh, we give everyone, which is what are your top three recommendations to men wanting to get results as fast as possible in this area of their lives? Ah, well, get the desire system. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, uh, assuming you've gotten the desire system, um, uh, implement it. No, okay, so one is develop, a, try to develop a greater self-awareness. Mm. I think this, I don't know if that's too deep for some guys, but basically with the whole problem is you as a person trying to get better with pickup mm. and you have some big gaping need that you're looking for women to fulfill. Mm. And you need to sense when that's happening mm. because when it's happening, you need to figure out what the triggers are for it and kill that. That's the most unattractive part of you. <laughs> The neediness part, mm. needing somebody else to fulfill you. you. The first step is self-awareness. The second is at proactively trying to kill your neediness. And the third is when you're able to get rid of your neediness, then you're able to project the positive emotions that you're feeling towards women. In terms of just the words, you can just, you can just talk about anything mm -hmm. that's non-sexual just to distract her prefrontal cortex while you're projecting through your mirror neurons you know, and letting those work the sexual desires that you have that are healthy and non-needy. Mm -hmm. Non-needy sexual desires are, are the most attractive thing in a man that he could project mm. emotionally. Um, but it's dangerous. To, so if you project needy sexual desire, it's very repellent. Mm. Kill the neediness. And as you're doing that, get good at projecting your desire. Mm. And that's all covered in the desire system, actually. Excellent. Well, David, man, it's been a pleasure as usual. Thank you very much for coming in today. Yeah, it was awesome talking to you as usual, man. My pleasure. Thank you. So guys, what did you think of today's show? Did you get a lot out of it? Let me know. You know, I always want to hear feedback. I feel that this is an advanced, really important subject, and I hope to cover it more in the future. It's all about self-development, improving yourself, you know, all of these topics we spoke about today. And it's a lot about your emotions and becoming a master of your emotions rather than having them master you. So I'm just rocking over to iTunes now and I see we have some new reviews. So I just want to give you a heads up on what some of these guys have been saying. There's a guy called Stan. He gave us five stars and he says, well worth a listen. He says, you can just tell effort is put into this podcast. Excellent guest choices, professionally presented with bags of credibility. Well, thanks, Stan. And this is, you know, this is exactly what I'm trying to do here. So I really appreciate when, when someone recognizes the fact that a lot of effort goes into, into this show. I actually, have, we have a little team here, you know, have an audio producer and so on that helps us get the quality up and everything. So I'm glad, you know, you've seen that and you can appreciate it, the, the time it takes for that. That makes it all worthwhile for me. I would love it if you guys could give us a rating too and some of your feedback. So the steps to do this are pretty simple, right? Just go to Google and type in dating podcast. We are now number one in Google searches for dating podcasts, which is pretty cool. So uh, you'll see the first link is an iTunes link. Click on that. I'll take you to the iTunes page for Dating Skills Podcast. On that page, you click, there's a blue link on the left, which is view in iTunes. You want to do this. So you click that view in iTunes button and it'll open iTunes for you. And then you want to click on the tab, which says ratings and reviews. And that will show you the existing ratings and reviews for the page. But it will also show you this little gray button at the top on the left, which says write a review. Please click on that. Put a title in, give us a star rating, whatever you think, and type in a few words, whatever your thoughts are, and you know, even some suggestions if you would like, and I'll listen to those. And I'll also start like calling them out on the show because I really want you guys to, to know, you know, where this show is going and what people are thinking about it and how we can improve on it and so on. So I look forward to more of your feedback there. To get the show notes, the transcript and all the links and stuff that we mentioned in the show, you can go to datingskillsreview.com slash DSP51. You'll also see now that there's a little box on the right of any of the podcast pages, which is a suggest a guest box. You can suggest any guest you would like me to interview on the show. 
It's quite simple. Just put a name of someone you would like me to interview in there and click submit. And we collect those. And it also helps us to kind of expand our horizons and find new people who would be worthy of bringing on the show and giving you some quality advice and tips and information. All right. So I see my mission as like I am scouring the world for interesting people for this show, for, for new, new quality perspectives that can help us get to the truth and become better at this. So if you want to help me find people that can help you, just submit whoever you think is useful and has some great ideas, and I'll try and get them on the show for you. Thanks a lot. And I'm going to see you guys very soon in another edition of Dating Skills Podcast. Have a great week. Take control of your dating life today. Take one idea or one insight from today's episode and apply it today. Don't wait. Do it today. That's all it takes to change your life step by step, episode by episode. Learn more about what I, Angel Donovan, and my team do at DatingSkillsReview.com how we help men like you take control of their dating lives.